He's like, you, you're not really like setting yourself up to do that. The fact that I'm running with Bailey in the stroller and the fact that I'm squashing runs in here and there. And he's like, it's not going to happen. And so I had to let that go that I was going to run a PR. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running for Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who hates needles, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 100 of the Running for Real podcast. I am probably the most excited I've been about, you know, announcing this episode, episode 100. That's a lot of episodes and this is just so exciting and I'm really happy that you are here right now. Thank you so much for choosing to listen to the Running For Real podcast. If this is your first episode, welcome. If this is your 100th episode, still welcome, but thank you for your support and your loyalty. I am so grateful for you being a part of this journey. Now, because of you, I actually have a book out, a book, a real life physical book. You can hold it in your hands. And I honestly never expected to consider myself as an author, but it's because of you, the support and kindness you've showed me that I've had the courage to do it. I wanted to write a book because, as you probably know, a few years ago, I openly talked about my struggle with amenorrhea or a loss of periods for those who do not know. I went nine years without having one while I was, uh, you know, achieving my running dreams, which is great. My story went totally viral and it ended up in all kinds of magazines from ESPN to Glamour, from the Daily Mail to Self and even People magazine who did three updates on me. Talk about a weird feeling. But anyway, I went through this for nine years and I said I'd kind of had enough and I know it wasn't healthy on my body and I wanted to make a change. I wanted to take a step into the next area of my life which for me was going to be having a child but even if you're not you know I've had a lot of women particularly reach out to me who are in maybe high school and it's probably best to kind of take this step before you get into college or before you know you really start to attack those running goals in the future but I knew how hard it was to go that alone and after receiving literally tens of thousands of emails messages and comments I wanted to give people a book that I wish I had, one that would have helped me. So I ended up writing this in my first year postpartum. Probably not the best idea for busyness wise, but it was something I wanted to do. But even if you're not working on getting your period back, and even if you're not a female, this book also has a focus on body image and learning to love yourself outside of being a runner. It'll also help show me that you appreciate all that I do. If you've never purchased anything from me before, this is something small you could do to show that you care. You can find my book, Overcoming Amenorrhea, by searching on Amazon, although I would suggest searching for my name. Have you ever tried searching or writing down the word amenorrhea? It's not easy. Or you can find a link at tinamuir.com forward slash book. Thank you so much. Now, today is the 100th episode and I considered bringing on a big guest, but I see that everywhere on all the other podcasts. They have all these big guests and it just kind of seems a bit repetitive sometimes. Um, You may have noticed that I really try not to have guests who have been on all the other podcasts recently. I really like to make things a bit unique and kind of stand out. So I thought about doing that, but then I thought running for real is a bit more kind of like conversations with friends and like in a coffee shop. And I thought this would just feel a bit more... I don't know, more with the brand, I guess. And you loved the episode I did last time with my dear friend, Sarah Crouch, that I thought after, you know, my win at Disney that everyone wanted to hear more about, I thought I would let Sarah totally take over the show. For those who do not know, Sarah is a 232 marathoner. She was the first American at Chicago in 2018. She has a half marathon PR of 111 and she's sponsored by 361. Now, as with last time, Sarah and I did not chat before. We started recording as soon as we both picked up the phone. So you're hearing our actual conversation here. All I did was tell her she was the host for the week and she could come up with whatever she wanted. As you'll see, her final four questions or my final four questions were absent this week. Instead, we have Sarah's five questions, but I'm sure you'll enjoy these ones she did ask because they are kind of funny. I'm just going to give you a minute to go order my book. (laughs) 
Just kidding. Here is my conversation. Let's go meet Sarah. Hi. I can't see you though. Okay, I just gave access to the camera. You know what I did? That was so stupid just now. What? So I'm getting I'm getting prepared for this and I grabbed, you know, my cup of water and I'm all set up and I I was like, you know, I might I might be hungry. And so I brought chips and salsa up here. <laughs> Although that being said, you know, there are podcasts like that ASMR. Have you heard of this? Mm -mm. So people, you can go on YouTube and find videos of people like crunching food and people like to listen to it. They they do. It's okay. You know what? Let's, let's just give it a shot. Hang on. Does that do anything for you? Yeah, that's, that's so exciting. I want to watch this all day long (laughs) and listen to it. Yeah. Not great. All right. That might be interesting for you. Sorry, what was that? That might be interesting for you trying to fit that um, fit that in in between my words. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> well, I thought about this since I'm hosting for the first time ever. What if I did it with like a completely different personality? Like I was just a jerk with a Boston accent who cuts you off every time you try to say something. If How that's about what that? you want to do. Go for it. <laughs> it's not. It's not. Although I should probably tell people in case they don't know. Um, very, very exciting news. This is your hundredth podcast episode. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Did you ever think you would get there? Yeah, I didn't think it would be, it would, well, I didn't say, it's not that I didn't think it'd be this soon because it's pretty obvious when it was going to be, but um, no, it feels like it was, it ha- feels like it hasn't been that many episodes. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It's gone by fast. And you know, it's, it's funny. I don't think I've actually ever asked you how you got into like podcasting in the first place. So kind of, let's just start there. Um, take me through your podcast journey and how you got to this point. It's been what, four or five years now. Yeah. Well, first off you have to welcome everyone. Cause they don't know what podcast this is. You haven't told them. <laughs> I'm the worst host. Uh, This is the Running For Real podcast. I am your host, Sarah Crouch, but just for this one episode, um, I'm actually interviewing your normal host, Tina Muir, who uh, has had some very exciting things take place, not Mm. just recently, but this entire um, last year, your whole life has kind of been up in it and we're going to, we're going to cover everything. But, uh, but yeah, as I mentioned, I would like to start with, uh, with talking about your podcast journey, because I think it's, it's very unique and uh, and interesting. So yeah, tell me how you got into this. Yeah, I think a lot of people actually know the story to this because, um, you know, I have been asked, you know, how it kind of came about because podcasts are kind of cool now, but they weren't, I mean, they were getting there when I was started this, but it was actually Jeff uh, Godet uh, when I worked for Runners Connect. When, I, when he brought me on, he pretty much said to me, you can either do videos or you can do a podcast. So I didn't even know what a podcast was, but I was like, I do not want to do videos. As you know, Sarah, <laughs> um, I am not someone who, uh, you know, spends hours getting ready in the morning. Um, Sarah, you, you might remember this. When we were in Tallahassee once, um, do you remember we were going out for dinner and you were like, OK, so we're going to leave here at like 530, whatever it was. And I was like, mm-hmm. OK. And it was like 330. And then you started getting ready about an hour to go. And then you're like, we're going at 5.30, okay? And I was like, yep, that's fine. And then you're like, we're going in about 30 minutes, okay? And I was still sitting there. (laughs) And then like 10 minutes to go, I like changed and just like, I don't know, like shook my hair around or something. And I was like, I'm ready. And you were like, okay. But like, I've never been that kind of person. So I knew I didn't want to do videos because I just, I just don't really have the, motivation to actually do much most of the time. So that's too much pressure. Well, you know how you talk about sometimes you see a social media picture and it doesn't tell the whole story. Well, Mm -hmm. I think we took a picture that night of us right before we left for dinner. And I don't think you'd be able to tell that one of us spent like 90 minutes getting ready and the (laughs) other spent 10 minutes getting ready. We both look great. Let's be honest. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But yeah, so then Jeff told me that. And then uh, when I worked for Runners Connect, and so I said, oh, okay, I'll do that. And I don't know if you know this, I'm sure you do somewhere in your memory, but Dave McGillivray was my first interview. Mm -hmm. And it was so bad, not his words, but just me. Like uh, it was echoing everything we said. It was like <laughs> tinny. I was moving things around. It, like, I was really nervous. I didn't really know what I was saying. So, oh, that was so bad. And people can listen to it if they really want to go back and find it. But it was just terrible. 
So isn't it funny how you see, even with anything like running or podcasting, you see, you can see now your growth between mm-hmm. the first episode and the hundredth episode. You're not, you've kind of settled into a groove and become, um, the host that you are now, but, uh, but yeah, no, it does. It definitely does take time. And I'm sure you learned pretty early on that there's, you know, pros and cons to anything you do podcasting yeah. included. So I was curious, what is the worst part about being a podcast host? Um, I think it's just all the chasing people up for, to find an interview. Like you get, mm-hmm. I get these big names, especially if I reach out to them and they respond, but even if they reach out to me and just finding a time that actually works and it's like, will this time work? Yeah. Uh, that time will work, but can we, and then, then the next day, can we do it this time, this week instead? And then the day before, I'm sorry, this came up and it's mostly just the, the faff Logistics. of trying to like get it actually together, especially with big time people, like they cancel quite a lot or something comes up and you have to be like, uh, persistent that you're going to keep trying until they actually get it. So yeah, that's definitely the most annoying thing. Yeah, no, for sure. But I, I know there's good stuff too. So what would be like the best part of being a podcast host? I think just like having conversations with people. I mean, you mentioned that, um, I, you know, I've kind of grown into it, but it's funny. You don't change. You just actually become comfortable being yes. who you are around your friends. And yeah. so that's why you and I work so well. Cause it's even more just kind of two friends chatting, but like once you kind of get to the point where you can just be yourself, which sounds so ridiculous. But once you get to the point where you can just talk like you would to friends, then it just becomes so much easier and so much more enjoyable. So I I love like that I can do that now and just kind of mess around with people and these people that uh, others put on a pedestal and think they're, you know, celebrities and they are in their own right, but I can just be myself, which is just nice. Yeah, I'm going to have to resist the urge right now because I want to ask you, but I know you can't answer this, but you know how we watch sometimes that um, spill your guts or fill your guts with yeah, James yeah, Corden. Yeah. Uh-huh. So really, basically, it's, you know, James Corden is the host and and they're, he's asking a celebrity host very uncomfortable questions and they either have to answer the question or eat something disgusting. And the, I want to ask you, like, who is the worst person you've ever had on the podcast? But I know you can't answer it. So instead, I'll ask you um, in your you know, present company excluded, um, who is your favorite person that you've had on the podcast and why? Uh, it's yeah, that even that is tricky because there's been so many that I've come off the phone and mm-hmm. I've been like, Steve, that was the best conversation. My mouth <laughs> is on the floor. Like it was amazing. And so there's so many people that come to mind. One that jumps to mind to me immediately, which is maybe a surprise to people, but maybe not is um, Dean Karnaz is purely because I had in my head that he was going to be this like pompous, like, you know, he's done thousands of interviews. He's been on these late night TV shows, like Mm -hmm. that he would just be like, have his answers already ready to go. But he was so real and so nice. And so I felt like I genuinely had a connection with him. And so like, that was one of my favorites because most of the time it's the opposite. I expect people to be amazing I mean, you know this, you're the same way. Like you're, we kind of definitely are optimists. And, yeah. um, like with him, I was a bit like, oh, he's going to be a bit like arrogant and just kind of like talking down, but he didn't, he wasn't that way at all. So that's kind of the one that comes to mind, but there's so many I, I, I loved. I just, I mean, I'm just looking at my list right now and there's so many people I love. Absolutely. For some reason, my, in my gut, I was like, she's probably going to say Jared Ward. I thought that might I do be get on really. Yeah. Jared is, Jared is someone, but I mean, that's just another one. There's, there's so many, um, that I could choose from. I mean, there's so many that are a little bit different. Like Dave yeah. Collins comes to mind. Uh, those who listen to, he's a uh, sports psychologist and he's really like gruff and kind of like to the point. And he's the kind of person that if you finished a race and you were crying, say, Oh, it went so bad. He'd be like, Oh, shut up and get on with it. Like, I just like, he's not the kind of person that like I would, uh, no. typically the world needs those kind of people yeah. though. You know, yeah. they have to balance out the other people who are people pleasers like us. So, um, <laughs> so it's, it, that is funny about Dean Carnanza's though, because I think it's, it's, we view people who are in the limelight like that, especially someone like him, who he once ran, you know, in a treadmill in the middle of Times Square as like Mm -hmm. this spectacle. I think part of us wants to hate the people who get so much attention like that, but it's really um, refreshing to hear that he would be, you know, down to earth. And, and, and even, you know, you listen to um, 
podcast like yours with Matt Fitzgerald. And, you know, he's very professional and he's very friendly. And then I, I met him and he is a slightly different person, you know, off the air. And he's he can be very crude and very mm-hmm. funny and, and very genuine. Um, you know, and I, I think it is remarkable the the reach that you've had, mm-hmm. um, not just with the people you've been able to interview, but with the audience that you built, because kind of like running, there are some athletes who flame up and they burn out really quickly. Um, just like some podcasts have an okay start, but they never really Mm -hmm. find the legs to give them a good enough reach with a following. And it's safe to say that you've now found yourself in a place where you have a good audience. And beyond that, you're still expanding in many ways. And I think one of those ways, um, is obviously the book that you're putting out. And Mm -hmm. I, I would, love to talk about that. I know, um, only a few people have read it so far, right? Well, it, when, ex- this t- comes out on, uh, Friday, the fir- uh, Friday, the first. So, um, it will have come out a few days prior. Is that oh, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So about, well, I guess about 10 days. So, so some people can, hopefully will have read it. it. Yes, we can talk okay, about it, but you got it early. So I would love to hear. Yeah. I, I haven't even asked you about your take really. So wh- yeah, whatever you yeah. were going to say, go for it. No, I'm, I'm absolutely dying to talk about it, but I think that for those that haven't, or maybe those who are thinking, Oh, do I want to read this or do I not? Could you give just kind of like a brief overview, um, of why you wrote it and then kind of just touch on the major points of, of what it covers? Mm -hmm. Well, the primary reason I wrote it was, um, I kind of became, as you know, the amenorrhea girl, um, when I kind of shared my story about, um, not having my period for nine years, you know, I talked to you about it and I mentioned you in the book with you being one of the people that kick-started this journey, um, when you were asking about, um, contraception, uh, within an elite athlete group. Um, and so when I shared my story, I had such an outpouring of people saying, thank you, people saying they'd been through it. And then I thought, okay, well, that's great. And, you know, I ended up in People Magazine and all these other publications. But then I thought, okay, well, life can kind of get back to normal now. But still to this day, I get so many messages from women uh, saying that they found my story and it's helped them. And so they would ask me questions and still do. And I just, I wanted, I mean, you know me, I, I wanted to help them so much. I wanted to write like you know, a a letter to to them, essentially like a, you know, 2000 word letter to each one of them. Mm -hmm. But I just, I couldn't keep doing that um, because it was a lot of the same things. And people would ask me all about the things I did. And so I thought I want to get a place where I can give everything I did to get better, uh, but not just to get over a menorrhea, but also to kind of respect your body and is I, I don't know if you agree, but it's also a lot about body image and, you know, it's loving who you are and finding things outside of running. So it's not even just for people with amenorrhea. It's got a large part of it is my kind of running journey from when I was a teenager all the way up to now. And then a lot of it is about kind of, yeah, like not letting running define who you are. Um, so I think it is for also for people who are not just going through amenorrhea, although that's obviously the primary reason I wrote it. Right. You know, for instance, I, I have never dealt with the struggle of amenorrhea and Mm -hmm. yet I was absolutely fascinated by the book. And I got to tell you, I think the part of your story that is the most interesting, um, is your dramatic shift in mindset from being this elite athlete to someone who was intentionally cutting way back on Mm -hmm. exercise and putting on weight in order to get your period back. And I was thinking about this recently because as you know, my sister Shannon, she's just over six months pregnant and we were running the other day slowly. Um, Mm -hmm. and she was telling me, she's like, you cannot possibly understand how strange it is to see your body change when as an athlete, you're hypersensitive, um, to the way your body looks and feels. And so for you, you took a leap of faith without being pregnant and saying, I'm going to go ahead and make this change. And I guess I never really asked you how hard was that for you to do? Because I have to imagine your brain was probably fighting you every step of the way because for 28 years, you'd been one way and then all of a sudden you had to completely rewire the way you were looking at your body and treating it. Yeah, I mean, part of it was, it was like a breaking point. So it was one of those moments where you finally like, you know what, I'm done. So that helped a lot because it meant that I was, you know that like you know the the typical thing of someone saying they finish a marathon and they're like I'm never going to do this again well I was in that moment so I was like I'm never doing this again but then so then that kind of made it easy for the initial time but yeah about three to four weeks in that like itch was there and I had to be like no no you've you've committed to this 
But then yeah. the other the other side of it, the hardest part was the not so much for me. It was wasn't so much gaining weight. It was mm. seeing the muscles like fade away. And you know this very clearly. Like if you extend out your knee, your quad muscles are like right there like <laughs> under the skin like they are yeah. very like strong and like if you did that to someone who wasn't a runner they'd be like whoa because <laughs> they're just like oh my god your muscles and um yeah. uh, so now I started to see it where it was just soft like the muscle yeah. was was basically wasting away and you know a lot of runners we struggle with uh when you take that time off after a big race you think oh I'm I'm losing my fitness I'm losing my fitness um, but you know that once you get going again, you will get it back pretty quickly. Whereas I had to come to terms with the fact that I don't know if I'm going to ever take yeah. up this again or, um, and had to be okay with that. And also, I don't know if this muscle is ever going to come back. Like I might kind of get to the point where I am just kind of um, jiggly. Not that there is anything wrong with that, but um you know, I'd, I'd always kind of joked around with my mum, like squeezing her arms and then squeezing my arms and how different they felt. Um, and uh, so I, it was it was just a, a bit of a strange feeling knowing that the muscle was just wasting away, essentially, and I had to be okay with it. Were you pretty vocal about that with, with Steve? Like, did you share your opinions or were you more of the suffer in silence kind of type? Um, no, I think I would talk to him. And I would write quite a lot. Like that's what I talked about in the book about writing to what is now Bailey, but writing mm -hmm. uh, a letter to Bailey uh, as often as I could to kind of talk about like my body is changing. I'm not really sure how I feel about it, but, you know, changing the way I looked at it, like I mentioned in the book about making it a pillow for her to sleep yes. on. Mm -hmm. So uh, changing the perspective of it. So that was that was a big thing. Yeah. One, one other thing that you talked about in the book that I felt was extremely powerful is you actually personified your period um, and you called yeah. it Penny. Yeah. And you said, you know, you, you kind of started to view it as this, you know, frightened little child that mm -hmm. had um, kind of withdrawn and hid. And so you, in a way, w by doing these things, you were coaxing it to come out again. But I have to imagine during this time, was it a little more difficult to go on social media and to see the women who you were friends with, elite athletes, performing well, maintaining these types of body while, while in a way you were, you were giving yours up? It, it wasn't at the beginning. It was a bit further down the road. Um, I think, so I stopped running in, it would have been March. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, March, I think, of 2017. And it wasn't till like New York kind of time I think it was either New York or Chicago where I was like, oh, you know, I kind of missed that feeling. Um, and the rest of the time throughout social media, um, I did feel that a little bit seeing the kind of elites and being like, hmm, I wonder what I would have done or where I would have been at. But at the same time, I also had that feeling that had I kept running and done that Gold Coast Marathon, Mm -hmm. I would have ended up hating running so much that I would have never gone back to it. Whereas at, by that point, I was running a little bit. So I kind of knew that it wasn't gone forever. But, you know, you see the teenage prodigies who run so well as teenagers mm -hmm. and then they get so burned out that you never see them run again. And I yeah. feel like I would have ended up like that had I kept going. So I also had that reminder that I actually, I'm still enjoying it or I am back to enjoying it because I took that break. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think also this may come as a surprise for you to hear. Um, but I remember I was training for Chicago at this time and I was approaching the race. I was maybe a week or two away and I suddenly found myself very jealous of the situation that you were in. Cause I didn't mm. want to do it. Of course, those feelings you have before a race where you're like, I'm about to hurt myself really bad. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember thinking, gosh, it would be really nice if I didn't have to do this anymore. If I could, you know, focus on something else or start a family or do, do this or that it's uh, I think it's a grass is always greener on the other yeah, side situation. Sure. Um, yeah, but, uh, okay. There is something I have to read from the book that I wrote down. I did, um, cut and paste a little bit in a way that I wanted it to be this succinct little paragraph that captures, um, I think a really important point of the book. So is it okay if I read something real quick? Sure. Okay. Um, you wrote each time an egg is released, you have another opportunity to produce an offspring. 
In the past, when we were living in caves and our threats were not a damaged ego from a comment on social media, but real threats to our very existence, we would not menstruate because it was not safe to do so, because you are literally running away from dangerous predators or circumstances. A pregnant woman would slow the tribe down, make it vulnerable and unlikely to survive. The dangers of an animal chasing us may have gone, but not enough time has passed to let our bodies know that we are no longer in danger. The fact that we are running so hard and so much gives it the same fear factor, which makes the reproductive system shut down. It is not safe to have a baby right now. Most of us who are in this situation are people who push hard, edge close to our limits, and give it our best. We are the people who would carry 12 bags in each hand, straining our muscles and cutting our fingers just to make sure we only take one trip from the car to the kitchen. We thrive on the challenge of seeing what we are made of. I think in just that little segment of the book, you so perfectly captured um, the woman to whom you are reaching out to. Mm. And I think that is such a beautiful thing. And I guess there's so much of our lives that are determined by our biology, but this is something I absolutely never thought of. And I remember reading this and my jaw just dropped. So I don't know if you had even thought about this before writing the book, but how much research went into um, kind of figuring out the nuts and bolts of your story? Not as much as it probably should have been. And that was going to be my first thing I said with response to your answer there that I say many times throughout the book, and you can attest to this, that I am not a scientist. I don't have a medical degree. Like this was basically my experience, what I had read in the No Period Now What book um, and just some other small research, some things my doctors had told me. Um, So not too much really. Um, You know, I did kind of check that a little bit that that was the reason. And then just, you know, I didn't mention it in that specific paragraph, but obviously a part of this slowing the tribe down is, um, kind of also food related. You know, if the, you know, you go back that far, they're not getting enough food, enough fuel, Mm -hmm. then you're not going to be able to fuel a baby. So a lot of that is part of that as well, but, um, not too much. I, I wanted to do more, but having had just had Bailey myself, I just didn't have the energy to sit down and read through (laughs) literature. So, um, It was more kind of just what I had learned along the way and, Mm -hmm. you know, just basic stuff. Yeah. And I think it was a good mix of that. It was good, solid stuff that you'd learned from, um, you know, the people you talked with in the books that you read, but it was Mm -hmm. also the other half of this book is a very intimate look at your specific journey, including, um, moments that I have to imagine were very painful to write about, such as the moment you truly felt, uh, hopeless, like your running was over and you were in England, came home and just collapsed on the floor in front of your family, just sobbing. So, I'm wondering, as I was reading this, I was like, was this therapeutic for you to write and get this out? Or was it, was it more painful to put it on paper, knowing that other people are going to read it? No, it was definitely like therapeutic and just kind of, it allowed me to see, kind of look at it uh, as a bigger picture. Whereas when you're very much in that moment, like when I, you know, went in the door of my parents' house, it felt for a moment like my life was over. And not that I knew it wasn't, but like, I felt that like devastated. Whereas as I was writing it, I was able to kind of look back on each of the stages that I'd been through and, and, you know, remind myself of uh, crushing things that had happened in the past, but had led to better things. Just as when we get injured as runners, it's always for a good reason. You know, we always are happy it happens afterwards, even though in the moment you're hating it, but afterwards you're always glad it happened because it leads to something else. So, um, it, it was therapeutic because it, it allowed me to step back and and just appreciate the journey that my body had been through and respect it a lot more, um, for what it had done rather than hating it for what it wasn't doing. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that is a really interesting way to put it. And, uh, I think also the mistakes that you made, it's, it's important to include those as well, because Mm -hmm. there are women out there right now who are going through the same things and making the same mistakes. And it's just, it's just this notion of holding your, if it, it, whatever it is that causes amenorrhea, if it's an eating disorder, if it's a specific type of, you know, exercise induced amenorrhea, you know, holding it at arm's length and saying, I'm the exception. It'll work out for me. I'm not worried about it just yet. Um, so if you could go back now looking at this entire journey, what would you change? What would you have changed in the way that you, um, you know, responded to these different signals your body was giving you? I, I honestly, I, I'm someone that I don't know if I would change anything because I think things have, 
it's that whole I love the film Butterfly Effect have you seen that mm-hmm. oh yeah of course and yeah. so for me it's very much that so I wouldn't have Bailey like she'd be someone else and so <laughs> I don't think I would change anything because it just kind of how was it how it was and and yes I could go back and you know I know it wasn't that healthy for me but the things I did and you know this isn't ideal for me to say because it's kind of justifying other people who are putting it off right now um but you know the fact that I got to run for my country I wouldn't have done that um Mm -hmm. um, I mean who knows maybe I would have but uh, because I would have been fueled better and so I would have been able to you know look after that a bit better but um I think so maybe it would have been like there's there's different roads that lead to the same destination, but yeah. I guess you never you'll never know because you took no. the road that you took. Yeah, no. and it's also I kind of like the fact that now I can go forward. Like once I do decide I really want to go back into competitive running, I can go forward um, with what I have learned and kind of show people that there is another side. So I like to think that I'm helping other people again because you know, I, I was running up to 70 miles a week in this past few months Mm -hmm. and still breastfeeding and I got my period back. So yeah, it showed (laughs) me that like whatever I did, I did it right. So, um, I'm hoping this, you know, when I go back to elite running or hopefully properly in the future, I can show people that this isn't the end. Whereas otherwise maybe they'd be suffering in silence still. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think it could have in the same way that your whole journey, you could have taken different roads. You it's possible, you know, that you could have decided after having Bailey, you know what, like this is enough and my running was enough and I don't want to come back. But you chose the road you took and it weirdly feels like it has just come full circle because Bailey's turning a year old. You just won the Disney half marathon (laughs) and we we have to talk about this. And in a way, I'm actually glad we haven't talked for a couple of weeks because this is going to be fresh and I need to hear about this race um, from start to finish, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Everything, yeah. laughs> well, uh, I mean, firstly, you know, do you remember when I first asked, told you that that was the race I wanted to do? Cause I swear it was while I was it still was pregnant. months ago. Was it? Yeah, it was a long, long, long. Well, I remember you telling me, you're like, I've always really wanted to do uh, one of the Disney races. And then you were like, hey, maybe I should use that as a comeback. But it was a long time ago. Yeah. I don't even remember how far. Yeah, because I, I can't remember when when it was that I first thought about it. But um, firstly, I want to say to you, so um, by the time this comes out, my full story, because uh, I broke it down on Instagram and it'll all be out by there. And I just want to say, like, I was talking to our friends, Morgan and Maggie, last night, and they both said that, you know, I said to them about um, how I didn't feel very good in the race and um, I didn't run, you know, as fast as I hoped I would, although I wouldn't trade that for PR and not winning that race. Winning the race the way it was was just perfect. But Mm. I told them that I actually ran six minutes slower than my half marathon personal best, Mm. which you knew um, looking at 119, you know, that's way off my time. But they said to them, they thought I had run like right where I was. And so for them, like Morgan in particular said, well, of course you won the Disney half marathon (laughs) because uh, like... I forget that people like you and I, you know, and you know, all the other elites and people at that top level know 119 is, is, is fast, but it's not elite Mm -hmm. level. And so, but I hear what you're saying, how to the recreational runner, anything faster than like 130 is superhuman. So yeah, no, I, I see what you're, I see what you're saying. And so I was kind of going about this, uh, afterwards being like, look, see, I'm proving that like, I'm like you, like everyone else, because I'm, you know, I didn't just jump back and, and run my, my best time. And I'm, you know, a long way off my personal best, but then I forget, like you said, to most people listening, it's all in yeah. that same category. Yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> you've I just now become unrelatable again because <laughs> you've now run fast. Like, so yeah, no, I see. I see. Were you expecting to break 120? Like, cause that, I mean, yeah. So, so yeah, you asked about the full thing. So about, um, maybe October, November, you know, I'd been running continuously since March. That's when I took two weeks off, um, with that, uh, glute issue I had, uh, but I've been running continuously since March. So in my head, you know, if you think to yourself about getting, what would that be? March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, eight months of training, you would think you would be in 
top shape, you know? Mm-hmm. So when I said that in October, I was like, Steve, do you think I can run a PR in January? Thinking by then I'm going to have had 10 months, maybe 11 of training. Uh, surely I'm going to be in PR shape. And he said to me, no. And I was like, first I was like, excuse me? Like, do you not have any faith in me? And I was like really offended. But then he was like, do you realize you took three months off running an exercise completely? And then you did over a year of basically jogging. He's Mm -hmm. like, you, you know, A, it's not going to bounce back like that, but B, you're not really like setting yourself up to do that. The fact that I'm running with Bailey in the stroller and the fact that I'm, you know, squashing runs in here and there and my workouts are literally running around the target parking lot. Um, Mm -hmm. He was like, it's not, it's not going to happen. And so I had to let that go that I was going to run a PR. And then it just Mm -hmm. became about, I want to win it or I want to enjoy it. And you never know with Disney. I mean, I was told Kim Smith ran there once and ran 110. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you never know who's going to be there, but then we went in thinking that I was in about 116 shape. And that's kind of what I hoped. I thought, I I thought and hoped I would be within the 116 to 117 range, which Mm. for me was respectable that wasn't a time that absolutely you know yeah. I I I would have been I would have been annoyed with that while I was an elite but I also would have been like well it's not terrible it's a decent race yeah yes. absolutely so um I went into it with that but then looking back now Steve and I both knew deep down I was never going to run that time not because I wasn't fit enough to run that time physically I was and I wasn't sore really I thought I was going to be really sore but I wasn't really sore the next few days but it was because we, I had traveled, um, I'd gone to San Antonio, yeah. then flown to England and been traveling around England, had, you know, time with family, squashed runs in here, there and everywhere. And then uh, on our flight back, I we had a five hour delay and oh, that man. just put the nail in the coffin because we got in then at 1 a.m., which was 24 hours after we had left my parents' house. And um, Bailey woke up at... 4 a.m. Mm-hmm. So I had three hours sleep. The following night I had five. And then wow, the following wow. day we traveled down to Disney, uh, my dad and I, and I had to carry Bailey around on my front. And, you know, traveling is not ideal the day before a race. Mm-hmm. So all those things, I just felt very flat. And that's, you asked about how I, how the race was. That's the interesting thing that I said, I wanted my goal of this race to be, to enjoy it. And I did enjoy parts of it. Like my smile was so big running down Main Street and starting the race and at a few points in between. But there were other parts. I felt like I was watching my body running along and I was kind of wanted to grab myself and shake myself and be like, this is your race. Look, listen to these songs. Because like (laughs) the songs that they were playing, like these classic Disney songs that I love. But I was like, I was kind of... um, you know, when, you know, you're just so tired that someone's saying that you're like, oh, this is a motivating song. Yeah. You're like, oh, eye of the tiger. It's the thrill of the fight. (laughs) But like, it's not actually, you're not like getting revved up by it. So I was just kind of, but I was grinding so hard. And I've spoken to you about, I've been worried that I've lost the ability to push myself Right. But I know I haven't after this because I was hurting from like mile four. Like it Did was you go case- out at one sixteen pace? No. I well, you know me, I don't look at my watch. So um I saw the my I they have the uh, clocks at each mile. So mm-hmm. I looked at mile one and it was five thirty eight, which is a little bit too fast, but not yeah. you know, for a first mile it's not way out. That's not like a five ten where I would have been, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. and then I didn't look again, but I knew I wasn't running that fast. I just felt very flat. Um, I felt like miles, I've mentioned this before. I met, I felt like I was in mile 15 to 20 of a marathon, you know, where you've uh, got the miles mm-hmm. in your legs, you yeah. know, you've got a long way. And I felt like I was riding that line and you know, this from the marathon, it's that line where, you know, just a little bit of revving up and your legs could just blow up. I just had that feeling from like mile four onwards. And I kept saying, just get to mile eight and then you can pick it up. You'll feel better then. Just get to mile nine and then you know you'll be close enough. But each of those miles, I was too scared to pick it up because I knew I could just sense. And you mentioned earlier about being able to read your body. I could Mm -hmm. feel that I was 
I was on that line of of don't push it anymore and it did kind of lock up that final mile I really my my legs started to lock up and I th- I I'm willing to bet my final mile was my slowest mile were you leading the whole time? Did you have any other women? Yeah, I was leading. Or? I had a lead cyclist who was amazing. This mm. guy was the best lead cyclist I could ever imagine. He was saying all the right things. But even that, he was saying like, all right, all right, come on, relax into your pace. You're looking strong. Like, let's let's get this together. Like, here's a downhill. Come on, shake your arms out. Get relaxed. You know, your, your breathing will come back. He was saying all the right things. But oh, it was wow. like, oh, that's nice. Because I just was like so just tired. I just felt tired. So, Isn't that the worst if you're in a race and it's hurting so bad? So even if someone says something nice, they're like, you look great. You're like, screw you. In your mind, you're like, <laughs> yeah. Well, he did say to really me resonate. at one point, I actually did start feeling okay at like mile 11. And he was mm-hmm. like, you're looking strong. This is better than you've looked all race. Oh. And I thought to myself, yeah, well, that just shows how bad I was looking. Because <laughs> if you've just said that, <laughs> I clearly wasn't just feeling bad. I was looking bad too. But um, right. But yeah, well, so that, is- that was, uh, I just want to finish this. And that was hard because I'd made my, my goal to enjoy it and I did enjoy it. But at the same time, I was just too tired to enjoy it. And we've all had that experience where, you know, you're, maybe you're at a party and it's your birthday and, and, you know, you're, maybe it's like 1am or something and you're like, oh, I'm supposed to be enjoying this. This is my birthday, but I just want to go and get in bed. Like you just don't. <laughs> so yeah. it, that was hard because I, I was trying to enjoy it. I was trying to force myself to enjoy it. And I did enjoy parts, but it wasn't what I, it wasn't the pure, simple joy that I kind of hoped it would be. But the finish line and running up uh, Main Street made up for that so much. You know, I think that's part of returning to racing because this was the first time that you were like, okay, I'm going for it and I'm seeing what I have. True racing is not pleasant. It's mm-hmm. not supposed to be. Um, and I think it's easier to find enjoyment in retrospect when you look back on it and think, wow, that was pretty cool that I did that, you know, a year after giving birth. And this is going to be a really cliche question, but before you got pregnant, a lot of the time we would talk about, oh, you know, look at all these women who have returned to running after having a baby. They seem to have this, you know, quote, mom strength. Did you feel like that was a real thing? Did you draw from you know, the strength of having gone through something like childbirth, did that seem to give you an extra edge knowing that you can go through worse pain than the pain of racing? Honestly, no, I don't know if I will get there with in a few years, like Steph Bruce, Bruce is a good example, um, of someone who, you know, struggled, it's did well, but struggled maybe a little bit the first few years. And now her kids are older and she's really able to kind of, um, just look at things differently and kind of get back into it, um, at a a whole new level. But for me, when I think about it that way, about like, I've been through childbirth or, um, you know, I, uh, thinking about Bailey, it kind of works the other way for me because I'm like, well, why does it matter? Like she loves me no matter what, or Mm. I'll think, um, I've been through childbirth and I'm like, so, so why am I doing this when I have a daughter? Like I'd rather be spending time with her. So I think it makes me kind of the opposite. And I actually honestly didn't really think about her much at all in the race, maybe two or three times, um, partly because I was feeling bad and just kind of trying to like grit, uh, use grit and grind to just get through it. But partly also because I didn't want to, because I didn't want to, um, kind of that whole thing. I talked to Alex Hutchinson on the podcast lately and people will maybe remember that episode. It was a a few ago, episode 98. And he said that smiling helps you Mm -hmm. and helps you feel better, but it also, you'll slow down a little bit when you smile, which Mm. why are you going to feel better? Because you're smiling or because (laughs) you just slow down a little bit. So it's that whole thing of like, I didn't want to think about her because then I'd maybe ease off and say, well, she doesn't care how fast I run anyway. So yeah. Yeah. Well, there was that really special moment of seeing her at the finish line. And Mm. I loved reading about that. And of course she has her adorable Bailey smile. And it's just this, this really precious thing that, um, that I think does add to the experience. But, uh, one thing that I've always been curious about and that I don't think you really covered in the book at all, but, 
um, for you during, you know, pregnancy and childbirth, was there anything that just completely surprised you that like no one warned you about or something that maybe happened to your body or anything like that? I know it's running for real and it's also, you know, <laughs> right now it's pregnancy for real, but was there anything that you would maybe warn someone who was a runner about be like, Hey, no one really mentions this, but this is something you got to look out for. See, I, I feel like I've like forgotten what it was like to be pregnant a lot of it, but, um, <laughs> Uh, something. One of the first thing I remember is going shopping for a massive bra for you. Do you remember yes. this? <laughs> yeah, I guess that is actually one thing. Um, the the size differences that you will go through is just insane. I mean, as you saw, like yeah. it just like they like balloon up and they get even bigger than you could ever imagine. And like particularly after you've just had the baby, they're really really sore. And again, I'm going to shout out for that Lululemon and light bra because I just, Lululemon has not paid me any money to say this, but it just <laughs> was the only bra that in those early days was like soft enough to wear even normally, let alone running. Yeah. Um, uh, so, and then, but then you kind of go all the way up and then you just slowly start coming down. So I kept finding that all these bras I'd bought along the way suddenly weren't fitting me and I was having to wear another bra underneath just to be able to wear that bra because it was too big and wow. so it that is I guess one thing um you know be prepared to to buy bras um I, another thing that comes to mind to me which is not really running related but buy a damn pregnancy pillow because people like <laughs> you know I was like it too I'm gonna just use pillows and I'm gonna stuff myself around but um that pregnancy pillow I have the um uh, it's called Leech Co. I think I, I'll put it. Snoogle is the name of the pillow. I'll mm -hmm. put a link in the show notes. That it's pillow, like a giant C, yes. right? And yeah. I made you lie in it, didn't I? Once I sure did. It's yes, so I did. comfortable. Yes, so, I almost ordered one, and I was like, I'm not pregnant. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like the best pillow ever. So I wouldn't say like don't hold out on that. Just um, just just get one of those. Although on the other side of things, everyone talks about these boppy like breastfeeding pillows. And I was stubbornly like, I am not buying a pillow to feed off when I can just use a normal pillow. And so I was so stubborn. And even when we were, I was having problems with her, um, which turned out to be because of the tongue tie, but um, I was just having problems. You know, I keep, kept seeing lactation people and they'd be like, oh, do, do you have one of these pillows? And I'm like, I am not buying one of those pillows. <laughs> um, and that was just my stubbornness when really I should have just got myself one. But um, and then the other thing I was going to say, just you read my Hypno Babies book. Mm -hmm. I think I sure that did. was yeah. very different. Um, the way that I approach that and it's not for everyone. Um, and you can say that yourself. Like some people are going to be like, that is a load of crap. But um, for me, that was so powerful to make me view it as a race and make me relaxed and get to what I considered the 20 mile mark of a marathon, which is essentially the pushing stage of the baby and have all my energy left. Um, that was just so powerful having hypno babies. Um, and it was a lot of work. Like I had to spend at least an hour every day doing it and I, I think I played for you the the really nice oh, calming yeah, yeah. Um, it's almost like a little, like, it was almost like a meditation tape, mm -hmm. but it was, I think the real power in hypno babies is in having you realize whether you buy into it or not, yeah. having you realize the, the importance that words actually pr play and how they affect your brain. And, and, and in referring to something like labor and pain and all of these words that we use to describe the childbirth experience that set you up to be very afraid yeah. of what you're about to go through. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I really liked. Like it was birthing waves and it was um, uh, your uh, birthing instead of uh, labor. And um, yeah, I just, uh, the wording was just, uh, um, just so good. And like just hearing on repeat, like my body is healthy and safe. Pregnancy is na natural, things like that. Just hearing these like positive affirmations just made me feel a lot calmer. So that's very random. I will put a link in the show notes for anyone who wants to read more. I don't want to talk about this too much because obviously mm. it's a bit, a bit different. Um, but that I definitely am glad I told that, but I, I know, I feel like you want something that was a bit weird or gross or <laughs> there wasn't really, I really, I'm always down for I something had, weird I have, or gross. Yeah. I mean, I get restless legs like crazy. Mm -hmm. So my restless legs were like, on hyperdrive during pregnancy but that was probably the worst thing for me was the restless legs like I just I felt like I was like twitching all the time and um 
Yeah, but I I can't even remember half of the bad stuff. Honestly, I did get a sent. I when I was in uh, my birthing stage, um, I was running to the bathroom between every contraction. So I probably oh, wow. went fifteen times in the first two hours, which wasn't oh, fun. Wow. But other wow. than that, I, I can't really think of anything else. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know I know that you know obviously Bailey. She's still a baby now. She's you know a year old. Um, but I'm thinking about the future from now. And, and, you know, I don't know if Bailey's ever going to listen to any of these or mm-hmm. anything like that, but what do you want her to grow up seeing from you? Not, not just as an athlete, as an athlete too, but also just as a strong woman who has, you know, started her own business, taken control of her life. And, and what do you hope that Bailey grows up seeing from you? Um, well, first I'll go into the kind of superficial things, you know, this, and, and many people listening know that I haven't let her watch screens yet. Um, cause mm-hmm. that's something really important to me that I am present for her. Um, you, I mean, we all know this with your phones, it's so easy to sit there and scroll or like, you know, let's say your baby is playing with something on the floor and you think, well, they're not really paying attention to me. I'm just going to go look at Facebook or whatever. Um, but then they look at you to kind of get some feedback. Maybe they put some blocks together or they Mm -hmm. um, kind of tap something and it made a noise and they look at you and you know in your head, you hear, you like feel them looking and you're like, look up, look up, look up. But you're like, oh, I just want to finish this, whatever it is. And then by the time you look up, they're already, they've taken it in that whatever you're doing is more interesting than them. So uh, I want her to know that, um, you know, she is enough because I think, you know, I, I love psychology stuff. Like I love self-help and I love learning about psychology. And a lot of it is, um, a lot of us grow up thinking that we're not enough. Mm. And I've, I just believe that with screens and with things that distract you, it tells that baby or that child that they're not enough to keep your attention. Um, and so that's one thing I want her to grow up seeing that, she's enough for me. She's enough who she is. She doesn't have to change who she is or look a certain way to, to, um, be enough. So that's one thing. And then I want her to see that you can work towards things and put lots of time and energy into things. Um, I've read the book recently called grit from Angela Duckworth. Mm-hmm. Have you read that book? I have. Yes. Yeah, and she good. talked, I love that she talked about like her whole family has to do each of them have one hard thing. And they all have to, you know, commit to this one hard thing, whatever theirs is. And I love the idea of that, that like at any point, Bailey has to work towards something. And it's very tempting with kids to like, if if she's trying to grab something and she keeps missing to just hand it to them. And I have to keep reminding myself, no, don't do that. Let her figure out how to do it. So I want her to see me doing that and see me say, I want this. Um, Like a a goal of mine in my life is to be on the Ellen DeGeneres show. Mm -hmm. I know that is going to be a long way away. I'm going to have to do something incredible to be on Ellen or something of the like, if she isn't still going with it. Mm-hmm. But uh, I want to see her, her to see me working towards things, knowing that I, you know, um, I'm going to get there somehow, but I don't know how. Well, yeah. And if you think about it that way for her, for any baby, frustration is a very good thing Mm. being frustrated because then when you're frustrated, you think, okay, how do I problem solve? If what you tell her is, Hey, mom's going to hand you that block every single time, then you're just saving her from that frustration, which in the end, if she's frustrated enough, she will figure out how to do it herself. Exactly. Um, wow. That's a really powerful lesson just for life, I think. And it's really uh, hard to do, especially with a baby, because like, you, you, you want to make them happy. And I, and I kind of see it now with my parents. This is just being very real. My parents are very much like they've always tidied up for my sister and I. So we would go to bed at night, leaving toys scattered and they would, we would come down in the morning and all the toys were back in their places. And so I have now, now I'm a parent. I'm very uh, aware of the fact that I started doing the same thing. But then I want to teach Bailey that when you finish with something, you put it away. So I have to remind myself to show her, okay, we're going to tidy away now, but I just want to help her. So I want to just do it for her. I want to make her have such a good life that she doesn't have to tidy (laughs) up. But in reality, that's hindering her in the future. Yeah. I guess it is kind of that notion of letting the kid touch the stove so that they know, so that Mm -hmm. they learn rather than saying every time, um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I look around at the people in my life who I used to be jealous of because I think about high school 
when people's parents would buy them a car for their 16th birthday or they'd get all this stuff. And for me, it's like, you know, my parents from, I was 17, I left the house. I never had another financial benefit from them. I had to pay for college. I had to do, do all this stuff. And I'm so grateful for that now because I'm financially independent. Whereas the people, Mm. there are people my age whose parents are still paying for their cell phone bill, their insurance, their car. And I, now I feel bad for them. So now you think about it, you know, the things that are hard in the moment to not spoil your kids, because look at Bailey. She's so damn cute. You just want to give her everything and pinch her cheeks and protect her from all sorts of pain. But, um, that's also crippling them, Mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. Yeah. That's a really tough balance to find, but I think that you're doing a really good job so far, if I do say so myself. And even when you were pregnant, I remember you telling me with the screen stuff, you're like, Bailey's going to learn the phone is for talking and for taking a picture of things. You're like, that's, that's it. I'm not Mm going to sit there and scroll through Instagram for an hour while she's playing by herself on the floor. And I remember thinking, wow, like, I'm glad you said that because someday when I have kids, like that's something I want to keep in mind too, you know? And it's hard, like, especially when they're just sitting there, like, like a playing with a, a box and you're just like, it's not like it's boring, but you're like, well, I could, you know, they wouldn't even notice. So it's very hard to actually do, especially if your phone dings and you're like, yeah. don't look, don't look. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's really true. Um, so I know you're getting this question a lot, but I do have to ask, are you, are you guys thinking more kids? Are you planning on returning to running? Like what is, what's next? Cause yeah. right now it's like, you know, you've obviously just made this huge step in your running. Mm. Are you going to continue to chase that? Or is that something you're comfortable sharing? Um, yeah, I, well, I think I've already talked to you about this a little bit, but, um, we do want to have a second, uh, hope, Hopefully we will be pregnant by the end of the year, but probably later half of the year, um, depending on how things go. Obviously, we would be very thankful to to have that kind of come together. Um, but I am toying around with the idea of uh, doing a spring marathon. Um, I'm hoping it can maybe be a rather famous one in the US up mm-hmm. on the east coast um but if i did it i would want to do it more to to run it than to race it because um um does it rhyme with lost him yeah yeah it does. <laughs> okay i don't That's know how you guessed one. what a good guess <laughs> well this is also something that i was wondering so i know you you got your period back and i was overjoyed to get that text are you actually you were, the, you were the first person i texted really it yeah. made my day it was just like what i could i knew it was coming at some point but are you afraid that like jumping back into training specifically marathon training will make it disappear again yeah i mean yeah i have talked to steve about that and and that's partly why i i would want to run boston not race it because i do want to be safe with my body at least until i've had the children that i right. want to have and then i can kind of test the waters a little bit um yeah. I'm obviously after what I've been through going to be very aware of it missing but I still want to be able to be like okay that was too much or um okay let's try increasing the mileage but keeping the intensity a bit lower or something like um I want to be very aware of it but knowing that we want to stop and have another kid um I would probably want to wait to go any higher than about 70 and I also mm-hmm. It's interesting, Steve and I have talked about, I've told you this, that I, I've kept one rest day a week. So I run six days a week. And Steve's kind of said to me, you know, if you want to add any more, it has to, you have to get rid of that rest day. But for me, once I take that rest day away, that, that yeah. represents, all right, it's game on. So yeah. I'm not ready to give that up. So um, I want to keep, I think 70 miles a week is, a, is about maxed out for six, for mm-hmm. me, for six days a week. Um, and so, um, I do want to get back to competitive running. I do want to, you know, run fast, but right now, um, I just don't have the desire to train at that level or push my, it's not even at the level of being an elite, but the commitment that it takes, I'm not Mm -hmm. prepared to do that yet. So if I run Boston, it would just be, um, you know, adding a few more miles to my long runs and, um, adding 10 to 20 more minutes in my workout. And that's it. Like, I don't really want to add much more. Well, that being said, even if it was simply maintaining the shape that you were in, someone who can run, um, 219 in the marathon should, should be able to still go out there and break 250, you know, Mm -hmm. Granted, I think it would be, like you said, wiser not to set a time goal, particularly at Boston, which is notoriously unpredictable weather-wise. Um, but I guess the good news is if for some reason your body went down that path again and you lost your period, you now know for sure how to get it back. Yeah, yeah. Which is a really beautiful thing. 
I'm sure you don't really need another ad from me. And let's be real, many of you aren't going to hear this anyway, as you probably have already skipped. But please, my friends, I really hope you will listen. Today, I'm sharing something with you that I've worked really hard on, something I'm really proud of. But also, I make sure these ads in general are only brands I believe in. I'm very picky, which is why there may be breaks in sponsors throughout the year. I refuse to bring on brands who are I feel are conning you or just kind of not living up to expectations. And I'm certainly not conning you myself today. All I'm here to do is ask for your help. I really want my book to become a bestseller. Don't worry, I'm not expecting it to be a New York Times bestseller, but I'd love for it to hit number one in the running category on Amazon. If you've enjoyed following me and learning more about my journey, this contains it in full detail. I give you my journey from a teenager all the way to right now and break down each of the things I did to get my period back and eventually fall pregnant on the first try. It's not just for those who are getting their period back. Obviously, that's the focus, but it's also about finding who you are and loving things outside of running. We've all struggled with that loss of identity when you have an injury, a bad race, you have to take some time off. And this is going to help to reduce that feeling in the future, because as much as we might hope that we're never going to go through that again, in reality, probably most of us are. You will discover that there is more to your life that you didn't even know about and how to find it. And besides that, purchasing a copy would really help show me that you appreciate me. As it is through Amazon, I make very few dollars through this, but it isn't about that for me. I wanted it to be a reasonable price and and not make money off my friends, but I do really want to make the Amazon bestseller list and you can help me get there. You can find my link at tinamuir.com forward slash book or by searching my name through Amazon, which is T-I-N-A-M-U-I-R. Oh, and friends, one more thing. If you already have a copy, would you do me a huge favor and share a picture of you with the book that makes my heart explode every time I see it? It means so much. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the episode with Sarah. Okay, so we are just about at that hour mark. So I have written down, you know how you always do questions at the end? Well, I've got some that I have personalized specifically for you. So you've just um, gone off on your own. You've gone rogue. Oh, yeah, I sure have. <laughs> I'm, I'd like to apologize in advance, but I think these are going to be pretty fun. Are you ready? Okay. Okay, I've got four of them, and they're all, uh, I think, actually five. Um, okay, so the first one was, um, would you rather PR at every distance 5K through marathon in 2019 or you never PR again, but one day during practice that no one can see, you break Paula Radcliffe's 215 world record, but you can never tell a soul about it. So you would go to bed every night for the rest of your life knowing you were the fastest person that has ever been on the planet, but no one else knew. Or you get to PR publicly and everything this year. I love how you, you just love these would you rather questions, don't you? You always I have. Sure I know you do. text Kyle bowling quite a lot about would you rather questions. <laughs> So, um, I know you his, love his are always like, he was like, Hey, we do this to each other every now and then, but he'll, he'll be like, Hey, you could break two thirty in the marathon, but instead of gels, you're taking a shot of hot sauce every five K. <laughs> <laughs> so it's stuff like that. It makes me laugh every time. I'm going to, I'm going to send him one of those today. That's okay. funny. Well, just for anyone listening, Kyle Bowling is uh, one of the speakers in my coming back from injury podcast series. Um, he is wonderful, has a chiropractic, um, mm-hmm. clinic in Louisville. Kentucky. And okay, so answer to your question, I would PR um, in every distance this year. Not even so much to do it this year and to do it publicly, but because I saw how painful that looked with Paula going to that level to get that 215. And for me, that level of pain, just I just couldn't. I just <laughs> don't think I could handle that right now. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, honestly, I think what I would, would agree. You choose? With, yeah. Well, for a much more selfish reason, though, I feel like if I broke a marathon world record in training and couldn't tell anyone, it would be like Superman never being able to tell Lois Lane that he wasn't just Clark Kent, this dumb nerd. You know, it's like it would feel <laughs> like I'd walk around and be like, nobody knows. Like it would be the worst feeling in the world. So, yeah, I think I would selfishly PR and everything instead. OK, this one is definitely for you. And I thought. I don't know what you're going to pick for this. So would you rather never be able to go out to eat again or never be able to eat sugar again for the rest of your life? Because I know you love both. I know, I know. I was so proud of that. So so when you say never eat sugar, I can't eat anything with sugar. So what about like no, pasta I, sauce that like That's have tiny- fine. I I mean like specifically sweets, like cake, candy, ice cream, anything that's like a dessert. You can never have sweets again. 
sugar in things is fine. There's sugar in ranch dressing. That can't. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, um, <laughs> I think I would have to pick. I would not eat sugar again because wow. But never think about if you could never go out to eat again. Like, but you can always of, make, like, if you want to go out to a steakhouse, you can always make a steak. But you know I what love I mean? the experience of like going out to yeah. eat with friends, like the memories you would make. Yeah, that's I, true. I feel like, yeah, I think feel like that's more valuable to me. Like, and as much as I love my sweets, I feel like I would get to a point where I wouldn't miss them. Whereas going out to eat, let's say it's, you know, a friend's birthday. Oh, we're, we're going to go out to this. You'd be like, oh, okay. Have fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. that's true. I should have changed it to like, okay, every time you go out to eat, you can only get one cup of clam chowder and that's it. So you can, you can still go out to eat, but every time it's a cup of clam chowder. <laughs> I thought you were going to say that like the punishment or the, the alternative was you can only get one clam cup of clam chowder in addition to whatever else you're getting. I was like, don't make people think I've got some clam chowder addiction. <laughs> like need a fix. <laughs> no, that'd be the weirdest thing to have an addiction to. Clam chowder. Wow. Um, there's someone in the world right now who's trying to quit eating clam chowder. That's so yeah, sad. Really rich. Yeah. Okay. So now given actually you referenced this a bit in the beginning. So I think I now know your answer to this. So sometimes every now and then, um, if you're going to a wedding or you like to go out, you'll put on a full face of makeup and hair and a dress. So would you rather never be able to ever dress up like that again or have to do it every single day? Never do so, it again, because so I'm me, all about like the natural. Or are you going to add more to this question? Well, so that would basically mean wearing like jeans, a T-shirt, no makeup and a ponytail to a wedding. If you were a bridesmaid or something like that, like you could never do it again. So you would insult a lot of people by never dressing up for an appropriate occasion again, mm. or you'd have to do it every single day. How long does it take me every single day? An hour, one hour, 60 minutes. So you're wasting an hour every no, single day. No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> no way. You know, I, I respect that. And I think, I think I would agree with that. Okay. So would the you last do the same? I, oh man, I really like my makeup. <laughs> you know that I do. I, even as I've gotten older and older, like I find it more and more fun. I bought fake eyelashes for the first time. I haven't tried them on or seen. I just want to know what they're like. Um, to feel like a diva. Uh, I don't, I don't, I honestly don't know. I think I'd have to do it every day because the thought of going to an occasion where I really needed to be dressed up and I wasn't that socially awkward, like part of it, it just like shrivels in terror mm -hmm. at the thought of that. Um, yeah, I think I'd probably do it every day. Uh, okay. So you're 30. If you could go back and have lunch with 20 year old Tina today, um, provided that, you know, you choose going out to eat and not having sugar. Uh, what would you want to tell her? Like, what advice would you give her? And is there anything that you would warn her about for the next 10 years? Uh, well, again, back to the butterfly effect thing, I wouldn't change too much, but I would say, um, those things that seem so big right now, and this can apply to us now, you know, I can, Oh yeah. I, uh, my cover of my book was just a disaster with the, the woman I was using, um, and I was getting so annoyed at, like on New Year's Eve when I was having this special time with my family and it wasn't ready and it was supposed to be ready. And I was so annoyed and I was like, oh, and you know, my aunt said to me, why are you, why are you so upset? Like, this is going to be okay. And I was like, no, because you know, people are going to miss it. And, um, uh, and now I look back like a few weeks later and I'm like, why was I so annoyed about that? So I would say, um, you know, everything that happens, um, is going to lead to one door, another door opening. So every bad thing is going to lead to something even, even greater. Um, every experience is going to teach you something that you're going to be using in future life. So, um, I guess it would just be enjoy as much of your life as you possibly can. Um, because it, it's so short and, and everything works out in the mm. end. Um, That's really beautiful. Especially when you think about like, that can help to be like, okay, what would 40 year old Tina tell 30 year old Tina today? Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of live your life based on that and mm -hmm. say like, look, like it's really, you've survived a hundred percent of your hard days so far. So you will get through anything that happens. You know, mm -hmm. the odds are very strongly in your favor for that. That's really beautiful. Um, okay. And the last one was simply, um, reading through, especially reading through your book. The one thing I continued to wonder was if you had the option and I think this kind of ties into what we were just talking about, the journey that you took gaining weight and stopping running, would you have done that any sooner than you did? Now that you know that it worked, um, that you got your period back, would you choose to do that sooner now if you had the option? Uh, I don't know. 
Probably not, but if I was to make it any sooner, it probably would have been after the London Marathon in when was that, April 2016 because I had had that world championship experience. I had had um, the... Uh, oh no, I probably would say after Europeans then. So I'd had the world championship. I'd run that massive PR in the in the London Marathon, broken 240, which was mm-hmm. the one thing I said I wanted the most. And um, and then run for my country again in Amsterdam, even though that wasn't a great race. I probably would have said then because then I was kind of going out on a high having done all the things I wanted to do rather than the next six months were kind of very much up and down. Like, do I want to do this? No, I don't want to do this. Do I want to do mm-hmm. this? Yes, I want to do this. Um, and CIM was was a great race, but it also was a very difficult race. And I'm not sure it contributed to me feeling better about the sport after it. I think that's right. why I struggled to recover. So yes, but I probably still wouldn't change it again because I feel like things happened the way they, they were meant to. Sure. And I think that for any woman who's kind of hovering on the edge of making that decision, I think that your story and particularly the book is going to help them decide, okay, either I'm going to take this leap of faith or I'm not. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think at the end of the day, that's all you can ask for. So, um, I'm super, I gotta be honest. I'm very proud of myself. I think we're clocking in right around an hour, which I was so, I was like, it's going to be 15 minutes. And then I'm going to be like, well, thank you for being on my podcast. (laughs) (laughs) No, you are amazing at this. You, uh, I should bring you on as a guest host more often. Um, maybe if if and when I get pregnant again, I can make you be my um, my guest host who hosts while I'm kind of uh, recovering. And uh, you can go find your own guests and interview people and stuff like that. Can I, uh, can I interview you while you're in labor? That would be a dream. <laughs> How are you feeling? <laughs> Hold on a minute. <laughs> ah, I know you. <laughs> so, no, I would like to uh, round up by, you know, joining all of your listeners and saying happy 100th episode. It has been a hell of a journey and uh, we are all very proud of you. And uh, of course, happy first birthday to Bailey as well. Like I told you, I'm mailing her a present this week um, and I really, really wish I could be there. And uh, I hope I get lots of pictures. Yeah. Um, but yeah. All right. Well, thank you so, so, so much. And I hope we do this again soon. Thank you, my darling. I really, really appreciate you you doing this. And um your questions as always were wonderful and just so you're so eloquent I'm so jealous of how well you speak you just you're amazing and everyone loves you it's easy to see why and uh, one final thing I'll say thank you to everyone listening Sarah told you a bit about the book I told you a bit about the book Overcoming Amenorrhea you can find links in the show notes you can also find links uh, you can just go to Amazon and search I'd probably say search my name because Sarah I don't know if you agree you're very good at spelling though uh, Amenorrhea is probably one of the hardest words to spell isn't it it is, but I think it would pop up if you just yeah. try to sound it out. Yeah, or even just write. Uh, it, it's probably it's easier to search my name. So if you want to do that. But thank you, Sarah. All right, we will uh, get right back. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, Or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. Well, isn't she the best? She's a natural. I'd better watch out or she might take me over. (laughs) I do think the next time I have to be off for a few weeks, I'm going to let her be the guest host. What do you think about that? Sarah is racing Boston this year, so I hope you will support and encourage her when she's out there being the, quote, brave little idiot, unquote, that she calls herself. I love that little phrase. As she goes for her sub 230 in the marathon. If you don't already follow Sarah, you will find her very inspiring, so go look her up. I hope you enjoyed that episode for my 100th episode, and you can find links to everything we talked about in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 100. And that's where you will also find a link to my book too. You purchasing a copy means so much. And once you do, if you could leave me a review on Amazon, that would be amazing. As you and I both know, reviews go a long way when when making a decision nowadays. So when you get home from your run or finish the washing up or whatever else you're doing, can you do that for me, please? Thank you so much. Now that's 100 episodes down. I wonder where we're going to be in 200. 
You can find me on social media to follow along in the meantime at Tina Muir 88 on Instagram, Tina Muir on Twitter, or you can come join our wonderful superstars community at tinamuir.com forward slash superstars. Let's see you next week. Episode 101. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information. 